All right, let me tell you quickly uh, where, I, where I want to be headed on Wednesday nights. It's always a little bit of a challenge when you finish a series that you've been in for a while and you're trying to decide what we're going to do for the next several weeks. Uh, so my intention, it, actually my intention was to start this tonight, but my intention is to get back to uh, John Piper's book, What Jesus Demands of the World. Uh, if you've been around for a while, I, I haven't looked back to see when the last time we were in that book. But uh, that book basically takes the commands of Jesus and looks at them one chapter at a time. And uh, just like the, books, the book title says, what Jesus demands of the world. These are the things that Jesus expects of us. And we worked through that book a little bit, uh, but didn't make our way all the way through it. I'd like to go back and kind of revisit some of that between now and at least between now and uh, the fall festival, which is the last Wednesday night in October, possibly beyond that. But that being said, I also reserve Wednesday nights that if I need to from time to time kind of finish up what I didn't finish on Sundays in the First Timothy series, uh, that we'll also do that as well. And that's the case tonight. Um, Joe and Phil asked me if I was going to address those verses that I didn't really address much uh, Sunday morning, and so I want to take the opportunity to do that tonight, uh, to be able to take a little bit more of a look uh, into 1 Timothy chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn with me to the first chapter of 1 Timothy. Uh, you can find that book uh, near the end of the New Testament. If you, just, if you don't know where it is, just start at the back and, and work, work backwards until you get there. Uh, but Sunday morning we looked, the intention was to look at the entire passage from verses 1 through 11, and I think for the most part we hit the main points of that passage, but I really didn't get to talk hardly at all about verses 8 through 11, and I think they are primarily illustrating a point that Paul was trying to make, and it's a point that we talked about. But that being said, it, it's scripture, it's very, it's very good for us to look specifically at those verses. And so I would like for us to do that tonight. And you can see both from what's on the screen and what's on your handout that uh, the discussion is about the function of the law. If you remember, if you weren't here with us Sunday morning, uh, the, the introduction to 1 Timothy, Timothy has, or Paul has charged Timothy to stay in Ephesus. Uh, he was sort of functioning as the pastor in Ephesus, but uh, more likely was, was fulfilling the role of like an apostolic delegate. So he was Paul's representative until the church could develop to the point of having their own elders and their own deacons. And Paul charged Timothy to stay in Ephesus specifically because of false teaching. That there were those in the church who were teaching false doctrine. And, and Paul said, we, we can't have that. It's so very important. And we talked about reasons for that uh, on Sunday morning. But I want us to go back to verses uh, 6 and 7 to pick up on kind of where that leads into verses 8 through 11. Uh, I think we have, to get, we have to get a little bit of a running start here to understand the flow of thought that, that Paul is bringing to this particular passage so he begins in verse 6 by saying certain persons, by swerving from these, and the these in that verse are the three things he referred to in verse 5, which are the, the ingredients that lead to love. And so those ingredients are a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And so he says those three things work together to produce love in us. And so... If you weren't here Sunday morning, we said that the two things to pull from that passage is we must love truth, we, we must value the truth of the Bible and hold to it and teach it and shape our lives according to it. We must love truth, but we also must truly love. And those, aren't, those, are, just, those are just two different sides of the same coin because if we are truly connected to the truth of God's Word, it will evidence itself in the fact that we love each other and that we love the people around us. That was Jesus' point when he was asked to summarize the law. And the, 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 the teacher of the law, the, the, the scribe, came and asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? 
And Jesus said, all of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus is a lot better than a Baptist pastor, apparently, because he could take the whole Old Testament and summarize it in two verses. I could take 11 verses and I could not cover it in an hour. So Jesus says all of that demonstrates itself in love. And remember that verse from 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul says we can have all the knowledge in the world, we can have all the prophecy in the world, but if we don't have love, it amounts to nothing. And so we must love truth, but we must truly love. And I, I could preach that sermon all again, but I, in order to get to verse 8 through 11... So we're picking up on verse 7. He says, these, these people who have missed that, they have wandered away into vain discussion. They desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So they're trying to stand in this place of being teachers, and they're using the law in order to assert their thinking upon the people. But, but Paul's point is... They don't understand the law. And then he goes into a little bit more explanation about the law. And so that's really where we come to tonight. Because then he begins to tell us a little bit more about the law. And, and how it's good and why it's good and who it's for. And so he says, now we know that the law is good. Uh, now the, I think the reason he has to say that is because if you, if you read all of the Pauline corpus. If you read all the letters of Paul, it would be possible to walk away from that thinking Paul doesn't have a very high regard for the law. I mean, he's, always, he's always talking about grace over law, and, and rightfully so. And in, in the book of Galatians, by the way, which we studied extensively when I first came here, he, he's always talking about faith as opposed to law. And so it, you, you could have a wrong understanding of Paul's view of the law, and he comes back and he says, now the law is good. The law in and of itself is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, Men who practice homosexuality, slavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So Paul is basically saying, I, I want you to understand why we have the law and who the law is for. So as you can see from your handout, that's what I hope to... Those are some of the questions that I hope to be able to answer tonight. Now, before we get to the text at all, uh, before we get to the text, we need to answer this, this first question, which is inherent in the text. This is kind of behind the text. Because if you ask the average person, especially out on the street today, if you say, well, we're going to talk about the law, they, they, wouldn't know, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. They would assume, well, you're talking about the laws of the world, you're, you're talking about the speed limit and the laws that are on the books in Washington, the laws that the city of Seneca has, and they, they wouldn't understand what Paul is referring to. And so we need to make sure we understand what Paul is referring to. Uh, so first of all, we need to understand that when, when the New Testament, especially Paul, but, but even really more generally the New Testament, when it refers to the law, it's, it's typically indicating the Mosaic law of the Old Testament. So it's it's not just all the commands in Scripture, although that's probably not far from the truth, but, but specifically it is this, this mosaic law, this set of governing rules that God gave to his people, the Israelites. So it is, it is very specifically the mosaic law. And we can find that in case you need some good reading and, and want to make sure you know exactly what Paul is referring to. You can find that in Exodus 20 through 23, the, the bulk of the book of Leviticus. Um, and then you can find it 
an expanded version in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, by the way, that's what the word Deuteronomy means, is second law. So it's, it's the Lord God giving his Israelites the law the second time and expanding upon that. So that's what we're talking about. That's what Paul is referring to. He's talking about the Mosaic law. Now, what are some unlawful uses of the law? Now, I'm pulling now on verse 8 where it says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So if we're going to talk about what it means to use it lawfully, I think it's, I think it's helpful first to understand what are some unlawful or some unbiblical, some un, unhelpful uses of the law. And I've kind of, I guess I've kind of um, grouped these together into two main problems that people tend to have with the law, two main wrong applications of the law. And the first one is that we cannot expect God's law to save us. We can't keep the law good enough to earn right standing with God. You know, we, we can't have a rule, a checklist, and say, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I'm doing, doing pretty good on this one, and expect that we're in right standing with the Lord as a result of those things. Uh, the story that comes to my mind right now is the the, uh, the, young, the rich young ruler who came up to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you've read the commandments. And he listed several of those commandments. And what was the, what was the response? I get a check mark on all those. I'm doing good. But Jesus said, this one thing you lack, sell all of your possessions and give to the poor. And it says that this man went away sad because he loved his possessions. Now the point of Jesus' answer was not that selling your possessions and giving it to the poor will save you. And if, you, if, you if that's the conclusion you come away with, then you're just as mistaken as the rich young ruler. That's not the point that Jesus is making. The point Jesus is making is, even though he had all these other things checked off, if he was truly trusting in Jesus, he'd be willing to do whatever Jesus was asking but the text makes it clear that he loved his possessions and the implication is more than he loved Jesus and he wasn't willing to do that. And so we know that the law can't save us. This, this guy, you know, thought he was doing pretty well in all of those situations. Uh, we get a little bit of a, a, a spelling out of this in Galatians chapter 2. Uh, verse 16 says... Uh, now we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, not justified, not made right with God, not given right standing with God by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Now what do you notice about that verse? Three times Paul says the same thing. He says it in three different ways, but three times he says the law can't justify you. You cannot be justified by keeping the law. It doesn't work. So we need to understand that an unlawful use of the law is, is, is the expectation that the law can save us. That's probably not the way that it was being abused in the church at Ephesus. It's not the way it was being abused in the church at Galatia, but that is certainly something that we need to understand. The second part we need to understand, this is probably more likely what was happening in both of those churches, is that we should not use God's law to burden others. So we, we can't expect God's law to save us but we also shouldn't use God's law to burden others. What I mean by that is, okay, now the checklist isn't necessarily for us. It's a checklist that I have to see if you're doing okay. You know, let me, let me, let me, let me examine your life by my checklist. And that's probably what was going on in these churches in Ephesus and the, the group of churches in Galatia. Guess where else it goes on? It goes on a lot in our culture today, in a lot of our churches today. And if we're honest with each other, 
goes on a lot in our hearts today. I don't know, I don't know where you are, but I'm, I'm a Pharisee by nature. I'm, I'm really good at evaluating other people based on my interpretation of God's Word. I'm actually much better at evaluating other people than I am at evaluating myself. And by the way, that's why we need the church. Because we tend to fool ourselves. We tend to evaluate ourselves as, as best we can. We're very, very easy on ourselves, and we're very hard on other people. That's exactly the point that Jesus was making in, in Matthew chapter 7, when he says, hey, why don't you remove that plank from your own eye before you try to get to the speck that's in your brother's eye? The point of that passage is not to say, and this is a different sermon, but I love to preach this sermon, so I'm going to give it to you anyway. The point of that passage is not to say, don't judge each other, okay? That's a misapplication of that text. Because what Jesus is calling for requires judgment. But what he's saying is, don't judge somebody else with a different standard than you hold yourself to. You're out there pointing out the speck in your brother's eye, and all the while you got a log in your own eye. Judge yourself. He's not saying don't make judgments about each other. Now, Paul tells us, by the way, we're not called to judge the world. We're not called, Christians are not called to sit in judgment over non Christians. Y'all heard that? That's straight out of. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think, maybe 6. Christians are not to sit in judgment over non-Christians. We are to help in judgment over fellow Christians. But let's be honest, which one of those comes more easily? It's a lot easier to look outside the doors of the church and say, man, look how bad they are. Look how wrong they get it. It's much more difficult to say, Okay, what kind of issues do we have that we need to work on? We should not use God's law to burden others. We shouldn't. Uh, look, at what, look at what Jesus said about the scribes and the Pharisees. This is uh, Matthew 23, verses 2 through 4. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. In other words, they sit in a seat of judgment in accordance with the law of Moses. That's exactly what he's saying. So do and observe whatever they tell you. Now, now, so just that statement by itself is, is pretty shocking. What Jesus is saying is, on the outside, it looks like they're telling you the right thing. So you can do what they tell you, but don't do what they're doing. For they preach, but they don't practice. Now listen to this part. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. So what is he saying? They're burdening others with God's law. That's not what God's law is intended for. God's law is not intended to be a baseball bat that he puts into our hands that we might go hit somebody else over the head with it. That's not the purpose of of God's law. Now, reminder, Paul says the law is good if you know what it's used for. If you know the right use of the law, it's a very good thing. So let's talk about let's talk about the right use of the law. What is the purpose of the law? Um, first of all, the law marks our boundaries. God is gracious in giving us boundaries. And that's, that's one of the things the law is for. It helps us to know what is good and what is bad. It's, it's kind of like those guardrails on a highway that keep us from going off in the ditch. So God marks our boundaries for us. He, he tells us what road he wants us to stay on. It's, and that's good for us. Just like when you're raising children. Children need boundaries, right? They don't want boundaries, necessarily, but they need boundaries. They need, they need parents who will say, okay, this is what you need to do. This, these are the things you need to avoid. 
that's good for children because it teaches them what the boundaries are. It gives them a moral base. It gives them a compass by which to view life. And so God's law works in much the same way. It helps us to evaluate what's good and what's bad. That doesn't necessarily mean we can evaluate every individual aspect of our life based on the law, but it gives us the big road signs. It gives us the big markers that we can, that we can mark our life with. But I think much more importantly, especially as it relates to our own individual walk with the Lord, the law exposes our sinfulness. Think about the purpose of the law. Have you, have you read recently the, the, the Mosaic Law? Have you read all the things that the Israelites were expected to do? All the provisions, all the, all the things they were asked to do? Is it an easy thing to do? No. Part of the reason for the law is to expose our sinfulness, to expose the fact that that we are sinners. And I, I chose that word sinfulness specifically. It doesn't just expose our sin. Because if we, if we talk about just exposing our sin, that, that tends to individualize things. Oh, it, it shows me that I'm wrong in this area, and it shows me that I'm wrong in this area, and it might show me that I'm wrong in this area. And all those things are true, but the purpose of the law is bigger than that. It's to show us not that we're wrong in each of those little individual areas, but you take a step back and to show us that we're sinners. To show us that we, we do not measure up. As it says in Romans uh, 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The law is one of the things that helps us to see that. And this is where we can kind of cross over into the New Testament as well. Paul is certainly talking about the Mosaic law. But this same principle applies now as New Testament believers. Now we have the, the New Testament. Now we have all the commands that Jesus gives and all the commands that Paul gives and all the commands that James gives and all the commands that Peter gives and all the commands that the writer of Hebrews gives and all the commands that all the Gospels give. And it's a bunch of stuff. And who in this room can do all of it? Perfectly. Your pastor can't. And so part of the purpose of the law is to expose our sinfulness. Uh, listen to what Paul said in Galatians 3.19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. So that the, the purpose of the law, it was added because of our sin. It's not intended to make us righteous, it's intended to show us that we're not righteous, that we don't measure up. That's the purpose of the law. And that's why if you think about this list, I'm not going to try to find the slides here, but if you think about this list that Paul has given for us in verses uh, 9 through 9 and 10, now let me just read it for you again. The law is not laid down for the just but for the lawless and disobedient, not for, the, not for the just, but for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane. So he's talking in, in fairly general terms in each of those things. And in my estimation, in those first three pairs of things, he's talking about our individual relationship with the Lord. So I think he's referring to the, the first and the greatest commandment. Love the Lord with all your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I think that's what Jesus is speaking to, or what Paul is speaking to when he says the law is for the unjust. It's for the, the disobedient. It's for the lawless. It's for, um, it's for the ungodly, the unholy. Think about it. all those things are, are describing how we fall short in our relationship with God. But then, then see how the, the list continues. For those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for men who practice homosexuality, for enslavers, liars, perjurers. Now, as I'm reading that list, is there another list that comes to your mind? <laughs> 
Does that sound a little bit like the Ten Commandments? I mean, you can see how the Ten Commandments is probably lying behind Paul's explanation there. And what he's showing us is that we don't measure up with the first four commandments, which are more vertical type relationships, our, our relationship with the Lord, and we don't measure up in the horizontal commandments, the last six commandments uh, of, the, of the Ten Commandments. So he kind of he points to all of those. And here's what I think is part of the danger as we church people read a list like this. You know how we tend to read a list like this? As if we're outsiders looking at somebody else. Going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. Instead of bringing ourselves into the list. You know, I had a visit one time with a prospective church member. And we basically got into this discussion about the law. Because, by the way, if you, if you haven't joined the church yet and you ever want to join the church, you're going to have a conversation with me to make, sure that I under, to make sure that I think you understand the gospel, to make sure that you understand how we actually can be saved and what Jesus did so that we can be saved. So we're going to have that conversation. So I was having that conversation with somebody, and basic summary is this person basically explained, you know, if we're good enough, we'll be saved. You know, if we, can, if we can do the right things. And I said, well, I hate to break it to you, but your pastor has broken all the Ten Commandments. He went, what are you talking about? What are you talking about you've broken the Ten Commandments? And I just went through them one at a time. And he was like, you've murdered somebody? I was like, no, but Jesus said if you're angry with your brother, it's the same effect. You know, I haven't specifically committed adultery, but I've, I've looked upon another woman lustfully, and Jesus said, that's just, that's just as bad. So I just went down the list, and I said, one of the problems is thinking that we're on the righteous side in our own efforts. And the whole purpose of the law is to expose our sinfulness. And that's why Jesus takes, this is what I think, the, this is what I think the, I'll get to you in just one second. What I think Jesus does with the Sermon on the Mount is I think he takes the external factors of the law of the Old Testament and he makes them internal. And he basically says, you know, it's not enough just to control the actions on the outside. You've got to worry about the motivations on the inside as well. And so Jesus' law takes it. It doesn't change the law, but it raises the bar so that we know we're not going to achieve that on our own. There's a message I want to find outside the church that people still love that says, Don't judge someone else because of their skin. Their skin. Amen. Yes. Now, we can have a conversation about that. Don't judge someone else because their sin is different than yours. We need to judge each other in the church. That's why, that's why you joined the church, is because you need help. That's why I'm a member of the church, because I need help. I need you to judge me. But what Danny's point is, and, and, and agreeably so, is that we need not see somebody else's sin as being more heinous than our sin. We need to make sure that we understand sin is sin. That doesn't necessarily mean all sin is equal, but all sin is sin. And our sin is just as much an offense to God as somebody else's sin. All of us, when we take an honest evaluation of the law, if we read it rightly, we recognize we fall short. We recognize that we miss the mark. So the law uh, is to mark our boundaries. The law is to expose our sinfulness and then much more gloriously the law points to our Savior. You see, it would be it would be a really depressing thing if the law only did the first two things. And see, that's why Jesus was so disgusted with the Pharisees. Because they used it to do the first two things in other people's lives. They marked the boundaries for people 
and they placed these heavy burdens on people. They, they exposed the sinfulness of all these other people, but they failed to do the third thing. Church, we can't fail to do the third thing. We're, we are not called to be the ones that convict the world around us. But if we just live the life that Jesus has called us to live, and if we will expound the truth that Jesus has called us to talk about, and if we will live that life, they will get that message. But if we don't follow through with the hope of the gospel, we are just as guilty as the Pharisees. Because all we have done is, is shown the world around us that they don't measure up that they're not good enough. What we need to do instead is to, to, to show them that collectively we're not good enough. And we, need, we all need Jesus because the, the, the law points us to Jesus. This is what Paul said about the law in Galatians 3. Before faith came, we were held captive under the law. We were imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. He's talking about Jesus and his life and ministry and death and resurrection. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. That word that's translated guardian, it, it carries the idea of a tutor, uh, someone who uh, was not officially the teacher of the children, but the one who would kind of come behind the teacher and make sure that the student was staying up on their lessons so that they were prepared for the teacher the next day. And Paul says that's the point of the law. The law is your guardian. The law is your tutor. The law, if I could paraphrase it a little bit, the law is like your escort taking you by the hand and showing you, okay, you don't, you don't measure up, but let me bring you over to the Savior. And the Savior does measure up. This is critically important for us as Christians. Because remember what Paul says. The law is good if you use it lawfully. It's not for the just, but for the lawless. And if we're not careful, we use it to measure ourselves. We, we use it to see if we measure up rather than, rather than allowing the law to remind us how much we need Jesus on a regular basis. You know, it, it always kind of hurts my heart when I hear anybody say anything to the effect of, you know, he just, he just, keeps, he just keeps talking about the gospel. You know, doesn't, doesn't he realize we're a bunch of Christians in here and we've already got the gospel? But we need the gospel every single day. Not to save us, not to keep saving us. If you're, when you're saved, you're saved. But we need the gospel so that every single day, when we fail, when we sin, when the law exposes that sinfulness, that we don't crumble down into a heap in sorrow and brokenness and disgust and self-pity and think, I can't believe I'm that wretched. I'm never going to amount to anything. No, when we, when we see the law, and when we see the law pointing us to Jesus every single day when we sin, that should point us to, man, look how great Jesus is. Look how amazing His grace is in my life. Look, look at how He covers the gap for me. Look at how he forgives me even when I fall. Look at how much I continue to need Jesus every single day. Now, I, I think Christians need the gospel just as much as anybody. We just, we just need to understand the law's purpose in our life. It is not intended to make us feel bad. But it is intended to make us feel inadequate without Jesus. It's, it's intended to continually point us to Jesus. Uh, let me just, I'll just wrap up by giving you this one test, okay? What did Jesus say was the most important commandment? 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Now that's just, he, he, he boiled it down to one commandment. You've probably seen those pictures on the internet that say he had one job. He couldn't do his one job. Jesus is giving us one job. And let me ask you, how do you do with that one job? Because even after Jesus boils it down to one job, I know I can't even do that one job. I, I can't even keep that one commandment consistently and completely in my life. So the law is not here to show me if I measure up. It's here to make me look up and see Jesus and how much I need him on a regular basis every single day and to appreciate his grace in my life. That's the point of the law for us. Not to be scorekeepers, but to point us to Jesus on a regular basis. Let's pray together.